your name. And Father, give you the honor and the glory for all that you're doing in our hearts and our lives. Father, we come through the time of the service where we take up an offering and give back to you, Father, that which is yours. Father, this morning we want to say thank you for the blessings that you bestowed upon us. Father, for the answered prayers this past week, for rain on Friday. And Father, all the other blessings you bestowed upon us this morning, Lord, we want to say thank you. Father, most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who came and was born in a manger. And Father, gave his life that we could be forgiven. Father, thank you for that. Thank you, Christ, for what you did at Calvary. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
quoting from, to remind the people. That is true because you do learn by repetition. I will tell you this, as a person who has wrestled with Greek and now wrestling with Hebrew, I am convinced it's not exactly how smart you are. Look at me. But it's that idea of repetition. To spend two or three hours a day looking at the language, going through the language. It's that idea of repetition. Because we do learn from repetition. I would encourage you this coming year, spend time in the Word. Every two, you know, set an hour or two aside just, just to read through it. Because you will be amazed how much you start to retain as you spend that time of repetition with God. As He reminds you of truths that I know most of you in this room already know, but we need to remind them of it from time to time. This is what Peter is doing for his readers there as he's writing 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. This says right here in verse 1, This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you in which I am stirring you up or up your sincere mind or pure mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this first of all. Now you may want to underline this and put an exclamation point. He's making a big point here. Know this first of all that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking following after their own lusts. Now really, lust, we, we think of that word as only sexual immorality, but the word there is, is, is a little broader than that. A, a better word may be urges, evil urges or their evil impulses. It's not just sexual immorality these people are searching after. It's just evil in general going against the commandments of God. And saying, where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept or being kept for the day of judgment and destruction and of, of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. <coughs> now, verse 9, I have this highlighted. Listen to what it says. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Now, it's okay to write your Bible. This Bible I have here is falling apart. I take the chapel, I write notes in while you're the preacher speak. I would encourage you, um, underline that word patient in, in verse 9, and we'll deal with it in just a minute. But I want to unlock that Greek word there just to kind of broaden the understanding of what Peter's communicating with. But underline that word patient and understand why in just a moment. Now many of us, <laughs> we have mixed emotions that Christmas is over. Are you glad Christmas is over? Are you glad all the shopping and the rushing and all this is over? Uh, we may be exhausted this morning or worn out, beat, bush, pooped, or just plain dog tired. We may be disappointed about the gifts we received, or maybe even the gifts that we gave. We may be worried this morning that we spent too much money, and we're dreading the coming bills in the mail, the five months of bills. And let's not forget, April's around the corner, and Uncle Sam's been waiting in the line as well. But most of us are happy and may have a glow on us this morning because we spent time with family and friends. It's been a wonderful experience. Uh, this past Sunday night, we had a wonderful Christmas, uh, I guess, play or cantata. It was beautiful, reminding us of the greatest gift that was ever given. A time to reflect upon the birth of our Lord. Now, one reason I was led to this scripture is because as we focused on His first coming, 
these past few weeks, I think it's only logical that now let's just shift our attention to the second coming. Because just like the first time, he came in the fullness of time, and according to prophecy, Jesus once again will come in the fullness of time, and according to prophecy. And in 1 Peter, I mean, excuse me, 2 Peter, we just read, he deals with this subject. Look what he tells us. Scoffers are going to come. Mockers will be there. Look, he said, remember this. In the last days, these mockers will come. And they're coming not just to mock you for your faith. Let's face it, here in the United States, where many consider the United States a Christian nation, we are becoming the minority. Church attendance is no longer considered that important. Church is something we tack on if we have time. God is, is being taken out of the public square. Which I find ironic, even in our Declaration of Independence, it says we are endowed by our Creator, referencing to God. So we see this shift happening. And these mockers are coming around us. In fact, I was watching uh, as, as uh, Bad and I went down to get something to eat at the hospital. The CNN had a thing on that. Who's this Jesus? And it's interesting to see the different points of view they're pulling in. Really, a lot of times, questioning is Jesus who? Did Jesus understand himself to be the person that we declare that he is today? Basically, what they were doing. And look what they're, they're asking. The question that Peter says that they're going to come asking is where is he? Everything is going on the sunrise and the sunset, generations come, generations go. And everything stays the same. You guys have been talking about how Jesus is going to come back for the past 2,000 plus years, and yet things keep going on. And Peter says they're going to do this in the last days, and that term last days is eschatos, which literally means in times. Eschatos is where we get our English word eschatology. What? That's a big to know word. Don't get worried. That means study of end times. So in these last days, What's he referring to? What are you referring to our present age? We are between the day of Pentecost, the birth of the church. You remember the day of Pentecost? Peter preached the message and over. Do you think God can still do that today, my man? Yes. Would you love to be here with man? I can imagine what it'd be like staying in this baptistry for over four hours, just constantly baptizing people. I'd probably be laughing, not because it's funny, because I'd be so happy. I don't I don't know, wow, that'd be something, wouldn't it? With Midway Baptist Church, this crew, we're going to build a new sanctuary. Wow, we just had 2,000 people profess Christ and join the church. Oh, <laughs> he can still do that. Yeah. But we're living between that time of the birth of the church age to when He comes again. That, maybe that's what Peter is referring to, our present age. This is the age of grace. And it's in this age that, by the way, He says in verse 9 that God is exercising patience that these mockers are going to come. Does it remind you of anything of an Old Testament story? I don't get a little ahead of myself. I remember some guy building an ark, and of course they hadn't seen rain, and he took a long, long time to build that ark, and he was preaching repentance, and people didn't listen to him either. In fact, Jesus himself, the gospel said, the second coming of man will be like the times of Noah. But boy, oh boy, when that rain started to fall, and that water started to come up out of the ground, people got serious real quick. There's going to be skeptics who belittle, ridicule, or marginalizing the teaching of God's Word. We see that happening today, don't we? We even have preachers who stand in the pulpit and don't believe in the virgin birth of Christ. Who don't believe in the physical resurrection of Christ. Well, my goodness, if you're not going to believe that, why be a preacher? I mean, come on. If you don't believe in the personal work of Jesus Christ, then what's the point? They will ask questions. Where is he? Why hasn't Christ come back yet? Why haven't the predictions come true? Where is he coming? Why hasn't he come? How can God sit back and let all this evil happen? What's going on? Perhaps some of you have those questions today. Peter said some why. Why? He hasn't returned yet. And he does give us insight there in verse uh, 5 and 6, I believe it is. <clears throat> referencing back to the days of Noah, talking about how the world was destroyed by water. 
He's saying these, these mockers, these scoffers are deliberately rejecting the Word of God just like they did back in Noah's day. <laughs> Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 tells us that then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of their thoughts, of their hearts was only on evil. Does that describe our society and culture today? You, you, could, you could sum it up like this. There was an overall lack of fear of God in their society and culture. Brothers and sisters, I think that the biggest problem we have is a lack of fear of God. Today. Not only in our society, but in our churches. Man. Yeah. It should humble me that this God who created me, who sustains this world, who could just blow me into oblivion. That's the God whom I serve. And that's the God who calls me into fellowship with Him. For many years, Noah built the ark and he preached a message of warning. But nobody listened. Nobody responded. I've had that same thought. Tim, get out of bed. Why, honey? You ain't no one going to listen to me, no way. And then my wife turns around preaching on me. Well, if they're listening to you, they're listening to the wrong person. They listen to God. Oh, I hate it. when you spare so long in this early morning. Yeah. <laughs> But you need to go because it's not good when it's called you. It's God who calls you. God's going to hold you accountable. Right. So do love when your wives hold you accountable like that. <laughs> but I've had those thoughts. No one listens. No one responds. And right now, we're living the season of preaching, pleading, and warning. Be born again. Get right with God. Come to Christ. Change the way you're living. Jesus is the Christ. Because one day, it's going to end. Any day now, the door of grace will be closed and judgment is going to come. That's the message of the gospel. The age of grace and forgiveness are going to close. Well, my goodness, then why is it over 2,000 years that door hasn't closed yet? Well, Peter gives us some insight. Look, he says, a day it's like a thousand years and a thousand years. Now, you can take this literally. I, I'm not getting that issue, but I think what Peter's paying to us is look, God doesn't see time the way you and I see time. We see it from the context of time. We're limited by time and space. We only know the here and now. We can't do nothing about five minutes ago. We don't know about five minutes from now. I mean, my goodness, my Christmas Eve was changed in the span of five minutes. They say, I know I was down in the ER with my wife having a temperature. Not sure what was going to happen. Many of you have been in the same position. Been sitting there, sitting down the house, everything fine, get a phone call, and next thing you know, your whole world's turned upside down. God doesn't live or contain by time and space. He's transcendent. He sees your life from beginning to end in one glance. That's what Peter's saying. God doesn't measure time. That's you could say time is really man's invention. God transcends it. God is the author of human history. Now there's two views of history. And I've even said this one myself, that history repeats itself. But I think to some degree history does repeat itself. But history is not circular where it just goes round and round. God put the world and the universe in motion. Beginning. And now He is bringing it, guiding it, leading into a specific time and point and place where he's going to send his son back. Right. Now the interesting thing in all this, way back here, he created the world, everything was good, it was wonderful, and then man rebelled. God at that point could have said, oh, free with you people, that's it, I'm done. But God said, no, I'm going to reclaim this creation for my own, it's mine. And from that beginning in time, back in the Old Testament, God puts a plan in motion how he's going to reclaim his creation. You need to read the Old Testament with that expectation because there are times in the Old Testament God has chosen Israelite people to bring this blessing upon the nations of the world. They blow it so much you can oh man, how's God going to do this and not break His promise? They've really blown it. Read some of the Old Testament stories. Then He sends His Son. And now because of His Son, the fulfillment of the prophecy in the book of Isaiah, many places have taken place. The Messiah has come. The sin problem has been dealt with. Now he's reclaiming his creation one life at a time. And 
the best part of all is called you and I to be part of it. And that until that one point in history, he's already foreordained, which Jesus says, by the way, he doesn't even know he's going to come again. God is the author of human history. He is leading it. He is guiding it. Nothing catches God off guard. I've witnessed to many people say, Tim, you don't understand what I've done. I've done so many horrible things. And I tell them, look, God already knows what you've done. Think about that. God knows you better than you know yourself, and still yet He calls out to you, come into fellowship with me. Doesn't that blow your mind? We get all dressed up, put makeup on, fix our hair, put nice clothes on. We try to impress everybody. And God sees right through that to the heart and still says to him, Come have a fellowship with me. Come to me. So that's one reason why he hasn't returned yet because God's not concerned with time as we are. And does God want to bless you in this life? Of course he does. But God's not really concerned about this life. Because this life is nothing compared to eternity. He is trying to prepare us and get us ready for eternity. If I'm lucky, I may live to be 85 years old, but what's 85 years compared to all of eternity? And now, this verse, I tell you, when I was reading this, I think I woke up my wife, bless her heart, because it just, man, it just grabbed a hold of my throat and started, as some preachers would say, started choking me. Look what he says in verse 9. He is patient towards you. That God is giving time for you and I to repent. That God is waiting for you and I to come to the Son and to receive salvation. And is delaying His coming in order to give people more time to come to Jesus. It says right here that He doesn't want anyone to perish. And I did a word search on that word that's translated patience. It can be translated long-suffering, forbearance. But listen to this. To bear up under provocation without complaint. Let me read that again. To bear up under provocation without complaint. And when I thought of that, I provoke God. I provoke His anger and His wrath and His condemnation because I've broken His laws. But God was patient toward me. And though He had every reason to take out His wrath on me, He was patient towards me. Wow. God is doing the same thing now. He's being patient with people. Why hasn't the Lord come back? And put things back in order the way they should be because He's exercising patience. My wife has quoted a verse to me out of Proverbs quite a lot. Fathers do not provoke your children under wrath. I never provoke you too, do I? Kind of put me on the spot. We get easily provoked, though, don't we? Someone cuts me off at one night, and I give them wine and peace symbol. You want to know what the wine and peace symbol is? Probably me after service. <laughs> kind of get the thrust. Maybe say a bad word, have a bad thought. But this guy, who has every reason to be provoked, I don't know if I can understand how this guy can be that patient. He's been patient with his own people who profess to be Christians and know his son and yet they don't live like it. And as a consequence causes more people to stumble. Preachers who mishandle his word and preach <laughs> things that the word does not say Preachers who, who use their position to do nothing but to, to make more money for themselves. And the list could go on and on. Maybe God's knocking on your heart this morning and asking if you're willing to come to Him. It may be for salvation. We call it a gift. 
and to receive it. You know, to be a gift, I have to receive it. If, if Tom here got a gift for me, I have to receive it to open it. Up. Have you received the gift of salvation? Maybe he's not going to be hard to pray for a family member or a friend who is lost. It may be that you know the Lord and you, you've had a profession of faith, but over time your heart's grown cold and callous. You've forgotten. That we are still sinners saved by grace. Call and knock him in your heart this morning. To the bottom line here is the Lord is delaying his return to give you I more time to confess and repent, to give us more time to take the gospel message to the 1.6 billion people on this planet who've never heard the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful that he gave me 28 years. During those 28 years, I provoked the wrath of God. And yes, I still fall short to this day. But after 28 years, I came to Christ. However, we must not kid ourselves that the warning is the delay is only temporary. At any moment, Christ may return suddenly like a thief in the night when we least expect it. Man, Mark chapter 13, verses 32 through 33. But of that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Take heed. Keep on the alert. For you do not know when the appointed time will come. Luke 21, verse 34. Be on guard so that your heart will not be weighed down with dispensation and drunkenness and the worries of life. And that that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. And in Matthew 24, verse 37, for the coming of sand, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, this eye, this theological truth of the coming of Christ is imminent. He's coming. And the age of grace does have a time. Of, there's two things right now. We don't know when Christ is going to return, and we do not know the day and the hour of our own death. Those facts alone should drive us to our knees every day. And we believe in one saved, always saved. And I believe that to be true because salvation is an act of God, not an act of man. We can't, we cannot manipulate God. But all of us in this room fall short. <coughs> Midway has come through some difficult times. I'm going to say this in conclusion. God brought this church in existence. God will sustain this church. God has demonstrated over this past year that He can take care of it. But it does not alleviate our responsibility of Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, where He tells us to go and to make disciples. And it's not just my job, it's not just Alan's job, it's not just the deacon's job, or the Sunday school teacher's job. It has to be all of us taking ownership of the ministry and going out. Because we know the time is short. And that that door is going to be closed someday soon. But before you and I can be used instruments of Christ, we sure our lives are Lord first. If you've never received the gift of salvation, now is the time. God is calling you. Maybe, maybe you've known God for a long time. Maybe you've been a member of this church ever since it, it started. Maybe you've been a Christian all your life. I, it's not about church attendance. Those are the things we do because of our relationship, not to obtain the relationship. Do you have a relationship with God? Has it grown callous and cold? The good news is come now. Repent. You're not going to tell God anything He doesn't mean. No. He'll forgive you. Just you all. And you'll walk out of here with a peace that you haven't felt in a very long, long time. A peace that passes all understanding. Maybe God's calling you into more active ownership in the ministry. Guys, I'm not looking here to Midway Baptist Church. I want to see the kingdom of God grow. If we seek His righteousness and His kingdom first, God will take everything else. And let me tell you something. One more thing. More than just like Peter said, in the last days, 
mockers and scoffers want to come. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to decide now. It's not being a Christian in America is not going to be as easy as it was over the last 50, 100 years. It's going to be more difficult. We're going to be challenged. We're going to be called more names. You have to decide now. Either I want to serve Christ and remain faithful or I'm not. I pray for myself every day. Lord, I'd like to see Midway grow, do more things, but God, I want to be found faithful in your sight. I do not want to compromise. Be ready. The Bible warns us. Have you read the book of Revelation? Some of the prophecies? It's going to get bad, better. I mean, it's going to get worse for it's better. Are you ready? Stay in front. That's the question he's asking us this morning. Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the for the promise, Jesus, you told us that no matter what happens, you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And as we go and to tell others about you, to be your witnesses, that your Holy Spirit will guide us into your truth and to guide us into what to say. Father, examine our own hearts this morning. Father, break through the cold and calluses that may be built up. Break us, dear God. And we build us up. Father, break our heart for the lost. Knowing that people die today without Jesus Christ has spend eternity in hell. And Father, you've given that mission to us to go to hell. And as my brother prayed this morning, that same passion, dear Jesus, you have for us that the reason why you came, that passion you had, may that be the same passion that dwells us to go out and tell others about you before it's everlasting too late. Continue to talk to us, dear God. Continue to draw us closer into, into your presence. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.